Hi everyone, it's Cameron from the Academic Skills Centre. Uh, I'm joined by my colleague Neil Roberts. Hello. How are uh, you going? Between myself and Neil, um, we've got 30 plus experience of working with Bond University students and uh, we thought we'd do a bit of a podcast on transitioning from high school into university. So I think between us, we've probably worked with a few thousand uh, students who have, who have done really or well at least, high school yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and moved on to university. And look, many of the students that we work with are very high achieving students. Um, they're, they're on the vice chancellor's list and the dean's award, they're receiving those kind of awards. Um, and some of them, you know, the success was instantaneous. It just happened. What they were doing in high school transitioned perfectly to university. Many students have found that there is a bit of a step up. Um, and I think we'd probably agree with that, wouldn't we, Neil? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. So there can be a bit of a step up from high school going into university. Um, and I guess the purpose of this podcast is to have a bit of a chat about what we've noticed over the years um, and give, give some future students and, uh, and continuing students some tips on how they can overcome that transition. So I guess um, the first thing that we both probably notice is the differences regarding study approaches. What's, what's been your experience with that, Neil? Um, I think it varies, really. Um, but particularly, we, we find perhaps it's from the, the med students and the law students that um, it's what they've done at, at high school doesn't really translate over to, 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 a, to a uni. Because at, at high school, you've managed to, to get away often with just memorizing a lot of stuff, pulling all-nighters and pulling things things out at the last minute and just re almost like sort of regurgitating that information and a lot of the stuff at, at high school in exams tends to be sort of descriptive and facts and things whereas at high school at, at, at university it tends to be a lot more analytical and you're using those facts to support an argument which is a bit of a kind of a different focus so have, you, have you found that yeah definitely i think that that key word regurgitating information. I think when you get to that tertiary level, it's no longer what can you memorize? It's more what do you understand? What do you know? That's it. Yeah. And what, can you demonstrate that what, understanding as well? What what does it mean? What does what what can you can you use that to support your argument, support where you're your your where you're going to, 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 to answer a question basically. You're using yeah. those facts to to make a point. Mm. Yeah. So I guess with that, and I think the other thing, I guess with that, you know, there's there's some study strategies that are effective, and there's some study strategies that are very ineffective. One of the things that I've noticed, and I, mm. I'll never forget this, we had a student, high achieving student, very very good high school grades, um, in medicine, in fact. And what she used to do was she had a textbook, as all students usually do. Each week, she would rewrite that textbook into her own notebook mm. uh, and highlight everything. Mm. And uh, it was it was something that I, 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 I I'll never forget because she said to me, this is what I do. This is how I'm studying. I'm not doing very well at university. Mm. What am I doing wrong? And I, and I remember mm. thinking, well, you know, clearly you're just reproducing something that you've already bought, something that's already been published. You're not doing anything with it. You know, where's your understanding? Where's your learning? So literally just that's rewriting it. the textbook or rewriting PowerPoint slides, it's probably the most ineffective uh, study technique that a student can utilize. Yeah, definitely. So, and I think that goes to lectures as well. Um, I spent some time watching to see what students do in lectures and, and a lot of students are just sitting there just copying down the PowerPoints or writing kind of verbatim what the lecturer is saying, which is, you know, it, you're not taking anything in when you're doing that. You, you're not managing to you know, the word, you, you connect it to you, personalize it, uh, to make connections and to process that information. And that, that's really the key thing that we want you to do to process that and to, um, to connect it with your own, what you do. 
Yeah. And I think that that's another key thing at university because that is most of what the, the, the papers, the assignments tend to be about getting some, something that you've done in, in class, theories, that kind of thing, models, and then applying to them to some kind of practical situation. So showing that you understand it by making your own um, e examples or case studies or that, that a lot of the assignments seem to be based around that sort of area. Making it yours. Definitely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, in lectures, what do we see? We see hundreds of students typing every word the lecturer is saying and again there's another mm. ineffective mm. study mm. strategy um, sometimes students yeah. forget to think during a class and and that should be mm. the first thing that that mm. we all do when we're learning something how does this apply to me yeah. um, do I agree with it have I learned something similar do I disagree with this information? So mm. actually sitting down in a lecture theater and thinking about what you're listening to, sure, you do have to take notes eventually because you're going to forget it in three months' time when it comes to final exams, but you don't have to be a scribe in the moment, in the lecture. Mm. Um, you can, I guess, learn in that moment. And in order to do that, you've got to do a bit of preparation before you go into the class as well, don't you? Mm, mm, yeah, yeah, because that makes it easy because otherwise you get that kind of cognitive overload. You've got so much information pouring over you that it's too much to, to, to focus. But the more you know, the more you know. So if you've done some preparation before you go in and you thought about it, it makes it – it's like watching a trailer for a movie. You know, Once you've seen the trailer for Avengers, you know what to expect. And it makes it much easier when you're actually in the lecture because you, you, you're knowing what to expect. You can predict what happens next and you can, you can take more in. It makes more sense. So how do you think students can do a bit of prep before a lecture? Well, I mean, obviously looking at the PowerPoint, if it's, if, if it's available, is always a good way. So you've gone through that stuff, you've, you've gone all that looks in. It's, it, it's like planning your journey before you go. You know, you think, oh, we're going to go here and, oh, what, what's that? Oh, I've heard of that before. Trying to get some kind of interest in the material. Um, just Wikipedia sometimes. Just, yeah. just Google a little bit of stuff. Get some general background about it so you know about it uh, before you go in. It doesn't have to be too specific, but just general stuff. Um, if you see a word that's repeated a lot of times, you know, a concept, you know that it's going to be really important. Um, but also very important, um, some of the, a lot of the lectures will have like learning objectives at the, the beginning of the, of, the, of the lecture. And they'll say, look, in this lecture, we're going to cover this, this, and this. And those are the things that you need to know. So that gives you a really good hint about what the important stuff is. But that also helps you to follow the, uh, the lecture because you know how it's organized and what, 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 what areas they're going to be looking at. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Would you definitely. say? Would you add to that? No, I think that I think that's terrific. I think um, you know, at that stage, when you're preparing for a lecture, preparing for a class, I think the main thing is don't go into a class cold. Uh, so many students will no, go in definitely. not even knowing what the topic is. So, so don't be that student if you're listening no. to our podcast. Um, instead, hit Google, Wikipedia, YouTube. Your best friend. Now, you're not going to use these mm -hmm. when it comes to writing an assignment, but just to get some information quickly so that you can actually sit in a lecture theatre and think about what your lecturer is teaching you. Um, it's just so much more effective. Mm -hmm. So I guess at the end of the week, perhaps, then there has to be some form of revision. Um, have you got any tips regarding mm -hmm. revision? Well, I think one of the things is to basically just regurgitate what you've known, but without looking at your notes. So it's almost, you know, I've done this with students and said, okay, so what was the lecture about yesterday? And as soon as I ask that question, what happens with their eyes is their eyes go up, turn up to the right hand corner. And it goes up to the right, which means that the brain is turned on and they're processing. And then they start to sort of think and they try to organize what's happened. Um, so that's a really good thing to just say, okay, what it was about, and then put it down on paper. Just try to, try to map out what it was. So that is your brain making sense of what you've learned. Mm. Um, and it's organizing it out. And mind maps are a fantastic way of, of doing that, to, to, to the map out that information. Um, and then as you're going along, you know, as, you, as, you're, as you're speaking it out, you're explaining it, you're mapping it out, you know what you know, but you also know what you don't know. 
And then it's the stuff that you don't know that you need to go back. The, the stuff that you find that you can't explain or you can't remember, that's the stuff you go back and you repatch. And then you go back and patch those little holes up in your knowledge. And you can guarantee... But you've got to do something with it. It's no, there's... I was just going to say, you can guarantee that what you don't know is on the mid-semester exam or the final exam, isn't it? <laughs> absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, that's really great. So, um, you but what you what you, what you don't want to do is just just to go reading through it. That's that's like the worst thing. Sitting there, I mean, we see this often in the library. Students just sitting there, just reading, not doing anything at all. There's nothing happening when you're just reading. You've got to do something with that information. So, basically, trying to test yourself on that stuff. That is the important thing. Yeah, so that's test great. it without looking, and then what you know and what you don't know. Excellent. You mentioned mind mapping. So you and I, we're pretty old mm. school. We're, we're pen and paper kind of guys. Um, mm. You know, I guess it depends on, on the student if they want to use digital technology, MindJet. Um, I think there's another one called VU. Oh, there's a whole lot of them. They all do the same thing. Yeah. 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 Um, but quick personally, and easy. I, I, I just find it just much faster. Definitely. It's much faster just to get a pen and paper. Um, you know, when you start to do things on a, on, put these things on a computer, just uh, with a mind jet and those other ones, it just takes a lot longer. Uh, it's less, it's much more difficult because very often with mind maps, you've done it rough and then you go, mm, that's not quite right. And then you do it again. And each, each time you do it, it gets better and better. Uh, it's not sort of just like a, a single mind map and that, that's it, you're done. Um, but it, 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 it's multiple times and usually you'll kind of get a, a, a big one and then you get a little bit smaller and a little bit smaller. And the idea would be that as you're going through the semester, you're, you're, you're going through uh, and going back again to revise what you've done because after, you know, was it 24 hours, you've forgotten up to 80%. So you've Scary. got to keep going back and repainting after the, after the first week, after the second week, after the fourth week, after the eighth week, after the 11th week, and you keep coming back to look at it. So by, by the end, you've got like a very, very condensed little mind map that you can use to keep going over to revise. Mm. And I guess by the end of the semester, because you've done all that work, your preparation for the final exam, it doesn't begin in week 13 uh, in the non-teaching exactly. week. You've been doing it throughout the semester. Yeah. So what you're finding is you've been reinforcing yep. your knowledge. You've been identifying the gaps mm. in your knowledge and hopefully you've uh, filled those gaps, filled those holes in your knowledge. And week 13, it's just consolidating and I, I guess really just pumping yeah. up your tires so that you feel really confident that That's you've it. got this when you walk yeah. into that exam, Hey, bring it on. This is not an exam. This mm. is an opportunity for me to demonstrate what I've learnt this semester in this subject. Mm. So that, um, that revision throughout the, the semester is really beneficial. Yeah. And I think it helps for next, the next class because it's not each each lecture or each week is not completely separate. You know, they're all joined together. It's all part of the same subject. So things flow through. You get these continuous themes that will be flowing through all the different subjects. So something that you learned in week one is going to come up in week four, in week six, in week nine or whatever. So if you're constantly repeating and, and, and going back and revising, that you're going to follow those themes and be able to keep up much easier. Yeah, that's great. So, you know, we encourage students take ownership of the knowledge as much as possible. All right, so we've been talking about study strategies. Maybe uh, we can move on just quickly to talk about assignments. So I guess academic writing at university mm. versus back in high school. Yes. Are there any things that you've noticed about a high school student? They've just finished year 12. They've come in maybe with their Bella for call one or they've come in with their first essay for a first mm. semester subject. Is there anything mm. that stands out for you? Yeah, I mean, I, I think like any kind of form of writing, it's it's a it's a new kind of writing that you're looking at. So it's something that takes time for you to, to you know to get to get into to uh, to adapt to that style. But I think one of the one of the big differences is that high school writing tends to be quite engaging. You want to make it very interesting for the reader, whereas university read writing. It's pretty boring. Yeah. You know, it's very objective. It's very fact-based. It's evidence-based. So there's a lot of things that we, we don't tend to use in acad academic writing. Uh, things like rhetorical questions. 
you know, so, so what are the problems facing da, 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 da. You know, we don't tend to use those ones. Uh, interestingly, they do in the United States, actually. That's common in the States, but it's certainly in Australia and UK that you, you've never put a rhetorical question in there. Don't ask questions, um, make statements instead. And again, you know, this is a fantastic thing when you're trying to engage an audience. You know, if you were doing a presentation, a rhetorical question is a fantastic device to do to, in, to engage with the audience. Uh, and in the same way that if you were doing a presentation or, or, or you're writing um, for, for, if you're, you know, for a magazine or something like that, you'd use a lot of you's and we's to, to, to engage the audience. But well, we want to avoid that writing. personal language, hey? Totally. Yeah. Anything with you, we, I, anything like that, you know, no, would, would, would not tend to be used at all. I guess the only exception is if students are writing reflections, um, they can use I, they can use personal language, still totally. avoid using you. Uh, mm. A lot of reflections I've seen uh, by all students, postgraduate students as well. Mm. They will say, when you do this, you might find well, hang on, you're talking directly to your lecturer mm. and hopefully your lecturer is an expert in that topic. So don't, don't tell the lecturer what he or she might be doing or should be doing. Uh, make it about your mm. personal learning. Mm. Mm. So we talked I, about... I don't try and use humour. Uh, no. I, I remember one of my one of my uh, my first essays at university. I thought, well, the lecture is going to be pretty bored here. You know, I'm going to put some jokes in and make it quite funny and engaging, and and it didn't go down well at all. <laughs> so uh, yeah, don't don't, try, don't you learned your lesson. Don't try that. I did. <laughs> now earlier you said um, it's it's very much evidence based. So there's there's a lot of evidence to support what we're saying in academic writing mm. at university. So I guess that means. There are a lot of references, um, probably more referencing required mm. at university than high school. Yes, there'll be a lot of referencing. I think one of the other things is that there are probably fewer quotes. Uh, one thing we notice often with high schools is there's a lot of, a lot of quotes are used. Uh, and again, the idea is that we want you to show that you can understand the ideas. So using your own words uh, shows, shows us that. So we don't really want many quotes. Um, if you're a psychology student, zero quotes. Uh, if, if you're law, then there are going to be a few more quotes in there because, of course, the judgments and the, you know, the acts and the, the cases and things like that are very important. But generally speaking, whenever possible, try and paraphrase. Um, one thing we do notice sometimes is that we tend to use, uh, a, a, we integrate the quote within into a sentence and the quote is supporting something that you said. Now, sometimes we find with high school students, it, it goes the other way around. They're taught at school, or certainly my son was, and I've seen this a lot with students, where they have the quote first, and then a line underneath that says, this quote means da 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 um, And it goes the other way around. The, the quote is supporting what you said, not, not, not the other way around. So really, the students should have a, um, a topic sentence at the beginning of a paragraph to indicate what the idea absolutely. is. And then that quote or all yep. those paraphrased ideas will then support whatever that topic sentence is talking about. Um, totally. What about referencing And the topic styles? sentence is particularly important. Referencing styles are, are well, there's, it, there's going to be different styles depending on what you're studying. Um, for the majority of students, it's going to be APA. Uh, if you're a law student, you're going to be using uh, AGLC, which is the Australian Guide to Legal Citation. Fourth edition. If you're a med student, you're going to Thing, uh, for, yes. <laughs> if you're a med student, you're going to be using Vancouver. And that's probably it, really. But uh, for the majority of students, um, it's APA. One thing that we, we do notice is that uh, students from high school, high school uh, uh, teachers often teach something called uh, like a Harvard, a very vague Harvard style, which often doesn't confirm to the, the, the actual um, the specifications of Harvard AB, AGPS, which is what we use at Bond if you get Harvard, which is fairly rare. It tends to be more APA. So, um, yeah, come, come and see us at Academic Skills Centre for, for some help with that referencing because yeah. uh, the, yeah. what, what you learn at school is can, often can be a little bit different. Yeah, and the good thing is the library website has some fantastic referencing guides yeah. as well for all of those styles that Neil mentioned. So there's a guide for each one. 
Um, so there's plenty of support, whether it's at Academic Skills Centre or the, the faculty librarians or any of the librarians, mm -hmm. actually. Um, so mm -hmm. I guess mm -hmm. in terms of tips for students working on assignments, um, I guess number one would be make sure you've understood the question and don't be afraid to go and see your lecturer and confirm that your understanding yeah. is what they've uh, asked you to do and what they want. Yeah. Make sure you're not missing anything. Yeah. We've also got these criteria sheets. Or and, and I think this is the big thing that Bond does. The, thing, the big thing at Bond as well is that that one-on-one -on -one help, you know, we're, we're really about that. So go and see the lecturer, go and see the tutor. Don't be afraid to do that. That's what we, you know, we really want you to, they expect you to, yeah. you know, that's an expectation that you will see the tutor and you see your lectures. So, you know, your lecturers complain when you don't come and see them and they have to wait in their office mm. when they could be going to get a coffee. Uh, obviously, right now, that's, yeah. that's not going to happen in their office. But with Collaborate, uh, we've got exactly the same uh, services available. So lecturers and tutors will be able to see students during their consultation hours, usually two hours per week throughout the semester. Don't be shy. Go and have a chat with your lecturer or your tutor. Um, I was just going to tell uh, the students listening about the criteria sheets or the rubrics. Sometimes they're called rubrics. Mm. Um, mm. How do how do we use rubrics or criteria sheets at Bond? Well, that's what you live and die by, really. Um, so it's really important because it's a tick in the box thing. You know, that you you got perhaps ten criteria, and each each criteria could be ten percent, or one could be twenty, or fifteen, or whatever. Uh, for that particular assignment. So it's crucial that you go through each one with a fine tooth comb and separate all the little bits out. And as you go, as you're reading, just tick that you've done those things because that's, that's where the marks are. It's as simple yeah. as that. Yeah. You use it to assess what you've done. And Hey, if, if you wanted to assess your own writing, assess your assignment using that mm. criteria before you submit it, make sure you're not missing anything from the task or from the criteria. Okay. So I think we're um, mm. ready to wrap it up. Um, I guess main messages, look, if you're not sure about anything, if something uh, you're doing, was okay to do in high school and you're not 100% sure if, if that's still okay to do or if it's still effective and efficient to do at university, come and have a chat with the Academic Skills Centre Learning Advisor, uh, Advisors, have a chat with your lecturers, with your tutors, uh, the library as well. There's so many support services available for students. Any final thoughts, Neil? Yeah, I mean, I think Academic Skills Centre are your biggest <laughs> friends at uni. Uh, we, we are your personal trainers. So that, that kind of adaptation from adapting from, uh, from high school to, to, to university, we're here to help that, that transition. We're going to really help you develop that style and work with you on your writing as you come in. And it'll make a huge difference on your marks and your stress levels and your enjoyment and your whole experience at university. So we'll see you soon at Academic Skills Centre. See you later. <laughs>